Thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, fundamental lessons that we have learned about uh, string theory. So the first part of my talk is going to be introducing uh, the, the basic uh, ideas. So string theory, uh, as you may have heard, is a theory which has been being pursued for about 45 years now uh, as a fundamental theory of everything. Now that's a big, uh, big undertaking. So clearly we cannot achieve everything, uh, even, uh, even if we limit ourselves just to the fundamental questions, uh, uh, very in, in a com complete detailed form. And that's the case for us today for string theory. Uh, we have learned a lot of things about string theory in the past 45 years, but a lot we haven't understood. It is the most promising candidate we have uh, for unifying Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, which is the theory of gravity, with quantum mechanics. So these two particular important pillars of modern physics. And the basic idea in it is that you have to replace basic particles, point particles, elementary particles like quark, by extended objects like strings. That's why it's called string theory. And, uh, but this happens at a very, very tiny scales. In other words, from far away distance, this loop might look just like this point. But if you zoom in to about a scale of about 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, then uh, these particles might have some extended features like this string or membrane or some such things. And this is uh, why we call this string theory, the importance of replacing elementary particles by these string-like excitations or string-like configurations. So for example, here is depicted a quark inside the nucleus, which can be viewed as a string if we kind of have a magnifying glass and look at it. And the basic process is uh, for the strings, in terms of producing new strings or interacting, the strings combining, uh, coming along and combining into another string in a very nice, uh, nice form. In this, in this way, you see two strings joining, and the opposite process would have given you a string splitting to two strings. And this underlines all possible interactions that we could, in principle, envision. Uh, and in some sense, it's a very nice way to unify all these particles and forces into one object. The particles are unified just to strings and all its uh, vibrational modes. And the interaction is all captured by the simple process of strings coming and joining and forming uh, new strings. But it's too early uh, to present the final formulation of string theory. Uh, it's work in progress. And work in progress implies uh, working in this context behind computers, sometimes blackboards. And experiments, unfortunately, can't help, at least not yet. And the problem is that the string, the size of the string is about trillion times, a trillion times too small to be measured or to be experimentally uh, measured by the energies that we have available in the colliders today. So it's very difficult to actually zoom in and give the pictures I was drawing. So, so therefore, we don't have uh, the luxury of using experiments to guide us in building our theory. So, and in particular, as I said, we have no experimental evidence of string theory to date. However, it turns out that even the incomplete knowledge of string theory gives us a lot of new principles of physics. It revolutionizes a lot of things we know about physics, even though we are far from the complete theory. And my aim is to try to give some sense of these new principles by, by guiding through some examples. So um, it's going to be, of course, difficult to describe all the things we have learned in string theory in one talk. But I'll try to at least take, take you through the tour of some highlights of some of the important ones that we have learned. And so if you, this picture is just to, uh, illustrate that I'm going to be talking about the parts under the, the lamppost, clearly. I'm not going to talk about far away in the dark, which we still don't know. But even what I'm going to tell you, even under the lamppost, there's a huge amount we have learned. And that's what I want to convey. But before I even start with string theory, I want to go back, step back, and talk about some historical lessons we have learned uh, 
through the history of physics itself. And in particular, I want to, see, I want to emphasize the fact that the, the development of physics and the new idea of physics comes always by giving up something we thought was fundamental and absolutely correct, something which we did not suspect can be false. This has happened again and again in physics, and as I will illustrate, string theory continues that tradition in, giving, in that we have to give up a number of principles that we thought are sacred. For example, let's go back and remind ourselves that at some point, Earth was viewed as the center of the universe. Now, in fact, uh, the Greeks were uh, very, very smart in recognizing, the, the, first of all, the fact that Earth was round, it's a globe, and they, they viewed, nevertheless, that the Earth is at the center of the universe. Okay? They didn't question that fact. It's, why not? It should be at the center of the universe. Uh, you know, it looks, they didn't probably have this picture, but anyhow, they, they had the picture of some kind of a globe. And uh, in fact, not only they, they had this idea that Earth is the center of the universe, they used it to argue why Earth is not moving. They thought Earth is not moving. Uh, so they wanted to explain why the Earth was stationary. And they had a very clever idea. They said, look, this is at the center of the universe. And if it were to move in any direction, it would break the fact that it's symmetric at right at the center. So if it goes that way, you say, oh, no, 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 it's not center anymore. You have lost the center, so it's not going to move. That was the argument for the Greek that the center, the universe, the, that not only we are at the center, but we are stationary. So they use the symmetry principle to argue why we are not going to be moving. The Earth is stationary. Now, of course, we recognize that this is a false statement because we know Earth is moving and so on. But what I wanted to point out here is the clever use of symmetry argument they used to try to convey a physical fact that they thought was true. But actually, uh, they were really smart. In fact, Aristotle disagreed with this reasoning. And in fact, he said, uh, yes, of course, Earth is at the center. But this does not necessarily mean that uh, because of symmetry, it can, can, cannot go anywhere because symmetry can be broken spontaneously. And he illustrated this by a very simple idea. He said, well, suppose you have a circle, and you have somebody at the center of the circle, symmetric like Earth or whatever, and you distribute food equally along that circle. Now, he said, are you going to tell me that the guy is not going to move to the circle to get food after a while, and is going to starve to death? Okay, so he was, he was saying that symmetry is not enough to say that preferred position is at the center. You will break symmetry to gain food in this example. You go some direction, and therefore you break the symmetry. So at any rate, the idea, that, that the idea here illustrates that the combination of the symmetries, symmetry breaking, and so on, was already being discussed by the Greek all the way back then. And, but nevertheless, they thought Earth was at the center of the universe. Today, we know that's one of the principles that's not true. We have given up that a while, long ago by now. There are other notions like this. For example, the absolute notion of time. You know, there's a, a time clicks everywhere the same way, we thought. Uh, and of course, uh, this gentleman showed us we are wrong. Einstein showed that time is relative. We don't have an absolute notion of, of, of time. And it, could, it depends on which observer is measuring it. So the absolute notion of time also we gave up. How about the absolute notion of the state of a system? Now, what do I mean by a state of a system? Well, where things are. I mean, you say there's a particle there, there's this, that. Can you actually describe, describe where things are in an absolute way? In other words, does it make sense to say where things are? And in fact, quantum fuzziness, the fact that if you try to describe the state of electrons in an atom, they look fuzzy. You cannot say exactly where they are when they have a given energy. They're kind of spread out. It says the absolute state of a system is also a little bit fuzzy. It's not quite possible to describe it that precisely there's some fuzziness. So even that, we had to give up. 
So these sounded at the time, before these amazing revolutions in physics, sounded obviously correct. Earth was at the center of the universe. There was an absolute notion of time. And of course, you could say where everything is. And all of these, by now, have fallen down. These are not principles of physics anymore. Similarly, string theory calls for radical changes of our understanding of the fundamentals of physics. And as I said, even though we don't know the full theory, we know enough to know that this has to come about and we have to have very different new ideas in physics. It is in some way reminiscent of early days of quantum mechanics when they had discovered that things are wavy, but they hadn't quite written down the correct precise equations that later was described by Heisenberg and Schrodinger. So we are in that stage in the development of string theory. We have understood that things are wavy, but we don't have a precise formulation of how that works. So this was of the way of a basic introduction to, to where we are heading. But I have to do the setting of the, of the stage of what it is that, uh, what kind of elements come into these uh, new principles. And the most important thing that we have learned in string theory is duality. Almost everything we know, everything interesting we know in string theory is in some way captured by this concept of duality. What that means is the general statement that two very different looking things can nevertheless be the same thing. Okay, two things which look completely different can be manifestations of the same thing. This is the general, general meaning I, I want to use as duality, that two things are the same despite the appearances. So here, I have described, I have drawn a, a picture here that you, you should imagine like every point here describes a physical theory. So you pick a point in this, and this every point you pick in this space corresponds to a solution in physics of, of some shape or some something describing the physical theory. So you think about a particular point as fixing your theory. In that point, for example, the electrons have this and that property, and, and our universe looks this and that way, and so forth. That corresponds to a point. So it's a summary of the details of the physical theory is this point. But you can have different kinds of physical theories. This point can move around in this space. So this is the parameter space in which you can choose different kinds of physical theories. You can change the mass of the electron. You can add more particles, and this and that. So this is kind of motion in this space is changing the theory. And it turns out that there are some special corners in these theories where the physics looks very, very special. These corner theories, one, two, three, four, five, six in this case, I've denoted, describe physical systems in which description simplifies. So you have an easy description. In the middle, the description of physics is very complicated. But in these corner theories, things will become very simple. So these corner theories, these easy theories that we can access, where we can actually describe the theory, are analogous to reference frames in Einstein's theory, which are useful reference frames. So as you may recall, in the context of Einstein's theory, physics might look different depending on how fast you are moving. So there's Physics can be described relative to a particular reference frame. These corner theories should be viewed as particularly preferred reference frame that the description is easier. For example, if I'm in this room, the easier description is for me to stand here and describe the objects around me. Of course, I could make a funny motion, go around in loops and so on, and describe the physics that I would see that way. Of course, that would not be very convenient. So similarly, these six cor these kind of corner theories are useful descriptions of the same system, but it's easier to describe it. So, so you could think about them that there are these easier versions of this theory that are, uh, are somewhat analogous to reference frames for which this physics description simplifies. And I'm going to call these corner theories duality frames. Just in analogy with reference frame of Einstein, which corresponds to choosing a particular speed that you're going with, I'm going to call about these as if they are going with particular speeds. You can think about these uh, 
these particular frames analogous to those. So that's the word duality frames. But mind you, they're describing the same kind of physics. It's just different corners. So then, just as in Einstein theory, in, in special theory of relativity, what was important was not what particular observer sees, because if you think about this object, the fact that it's stationary relative to me is only relative to me it's stationary. If somebody is going with the speed that way, it will, this object will be looking going the other way. So to talk about the velocity of this particle as an absolutely important concept is a bad idea. That's relative to me, it has a given speed. So the invariant concept in this case is the mass of the object, for example, or the rest mass of this object. That's invariant. So there are these kinds of concepts that we want to understand as what it is that distinguishes physics which, for which all of these guys agree. In other words, what is an invariant concept we have to understand? So what is in the context that we are dealing in the context of string theory, what are duality frame invariants? So that's the question that, that, that is posed uh, that we need to understand. There's a nice, uh, there's a familiar analogy. So if you look at the, the phase, what this is called the phase diagram of some, some liquid, let's say, some object, I mean, and they have different phases like a liquid, solid, or gas. Depending on the pressure and temperature, you could be in any of these phases. At low temperatures, you might get solid. If you increase temperature, you can get liquid. And if you increase it further, you could get a gas. So these are different phases. And of course, even though they're different uh, phases, what is not changing here is the object itself. It's made of particular atoms. Of course, the details about how close they are or how far they are from each other and what kind of situation they are in are changing. So different phases. But the invariant concept in this case is the, the, the molecule that's made of. And in fact, uh, for example, in this particular case, there is no easy characterization of liquid versus gas. You might think there's an absolute way to say this is liquid versus this is gas. But actually, there's a continuous way you can change going from being a liquid to being a gas. And there is no phase transition anywhere if you go away around this critical point B. And so therefore, this idea that you can have a, a indistinguishable theory, indistinguishable phase, is clear in this example that the only way to, to describe it invariantly is in terms of these molecules, because there is no particular place that this liquid became gas and vice versa. So this is the way we are going to be having it in the context of duality and string theory. It's somewhat analogous to this beautiful drawing of Escher, where if you look at this frame, there are these, there are these different uh, corners of this, of this drawing for which different things are going on. So for example, in this corner, you have these black birds flying in this uh, white sky. And over here is the night sky. And uh, the white birds are flying. And down here, it's day. And then there's, there's the city. And so the same, same situation here, except it's night. And everything here is kind of flipped from, from one side to the other. From left to the right goes from day to night. From up to the down goes from birds to this, uh, to the ground. But as you can see, it kind of seamlessly goes from one side to the other. So these are the corner theories I'm talking about, these four corners in this case. The description simplifies. You can say, oh yeah, it's just a day and the birds are flying. Or oh, it's night and some white birds are flying. Or something else is going on here and here. So these are easier description. But of course, if you go from one of them to the other one, it gradually changes completely to something else, seamlessly. And this is what happens in the context of these dualities in string theory. So this is the picture to keep in mind. OK, so, so that was uh, the, the basic beginning of our setting of the stage. And we begin to ask our questions. The first question, are particles basic building blocks of matter? Are point particles basic building blocks of matter? This was a principle that was uh, originally suggested actually by the Greek again, the idea of atom as some indivisible thing that, can be, can, that every matter is made of. And it was extended in modern days to the notion of the elementary particles. But uh, as, we, as I already discussed, in the context of string theory, we know that particles are replaced by extended objects like strings or even like membranes. 
So we already know one principle had to go. The basic building blocks of matter are not point particles. That's the first absolute thing which is gone. In fact, more generally, you can get different dimensional objects playing the role of particles. You can have, I said about, talked about membranes, be like sheets, or you can have higher dimensional objects like cubes and this and that. So you can have completely different kind of zoo of particles, not just elementary point-like particles. And in fact, you can have more interesting things like particle, the analog of the particles stretching between each other. For example, you can have a, a, a sheet here, described here by this blue plane, and then you have another particle, which is this yellow one, which ends on it. So you can have different kind of configuration of these guys, and these are, you could think of them as elementary ingredients in this theory. So the existence of these extra object, extended object, is what is the hall, one hallmark of string theory. You can have very interesting structures, and in fact, it, it uh, dovetails beautifully with pieces of mathematics. So you can have, for example, a bunch of planes, let's say n planes, next to each other, stack them up next to each other. And then you can have these strings, which are ending on pairs of them on either side, one from one to the other one. So you can have different kinds of strings depending on where they end from the left to the right. Of course, there are n choices they can start and n choices that they can end in. And this gives you an n by n matrix of strings. So this maps the possibilities of a string to an n by n matrix of where they start and where they end. And this turns out to be related to the fact that n by n matrices sometimes can describe forces in physics. The gauge forces have a symmetry principle which is captured by an n by n matrix. And this is a geometric way that string theory captures it. So now I want to move on to the next uh, topic, which is the basics of space. So we have now set the stage for what are the basics of particles. We said particles are now replaced by extended objects. What about where the particles or these membranes or strings live in? The space itself, what, do we, what can we say about that? For example, the very basic thing about the space is that you can put a ruler stick and start measuring it, right? You can start measuring it. Is the notion of distance a well-defined concept. In Einstein's theory, it is. In Einstein's theory, you can come and measure the distance from one point to another. It's a perfectly well-defined question. So for example, if you have a circle and you want to measure it, one way of doing it for, for which, the, uh, for which uh, you can get the radius is that you can send a light around it and measure how long it takes to come back. For example, this gives you a notion of the diameter of the space. So the, more precisely, the radius is the speed of light times the time it takes. So you can, you can find out what's the diameter of the space. So there's a natural notion of the diameter of the space, which makes sense. But it turns out that the length is not a duality invariant concept in string theory. And in particular, you can imagine having a circle of some radius r and another circle of radius 1 over r. So when the circle is big, this circle will be small, and this is small, then they are same size, and this is small, and this is big. So you can reverse the roles. They look very different in Einstein's theory. In one of them, if you, you send the light around, it takes a long time to come back, and here, the light takes a short time to come back. However, it turns out that there is a duality which maps this theory to this theory in the sense that it, when you start taking a light around here, that I have drawn here, as we are trying to send the light around the circle and measure how long it takes to come back, over here, instead of this light, you end up sending a wound string. Instead of this, the light to be at a given point and taking it around, over here you have a string which is wound around the whole circle. And sending it around looks very strange, but you can, and the time it takes here will give you the same time over there. In other words, there are two kinds of lights. What we call these lights of this type, which is sometimes called the momentum state, and these kind of lights, which are called winding states. So there are two different lights. Depending on which laser pointer you use of the winding type or the momentum type, you get different answers for the radius. You get either r or 1 over r. So the notion of distance is not an absolutely invariant concept. 
similarly, over this side, if you send the regular light, you get the measure of the distance, which is 1 over r, but which corresponds to the winding of this other string. So they have a completely different notions, and you measure different distances. So we learned that the notion of distance is not an absolute concept. It's topology of a space an invariant concept. Now, what does topology of a space mean? It sounds like a very high level math, but really, I, I don't mean anything that fancy. It's, it's something very simple. It's something which distinguishes spaces from each other without even paying attention to distances. We know distance was not an invariant concept in string theory. How about some more gross features of the space? Like, say, how many handles a space has? How many holes does it have? Or some gross features without actually measuring them. Now, that, that, that should be, you would think, a naturally invariant concept that if you have a space, you should be able to say, well, this has two holes, this has five holes, this has nine holes, etc. It turns out that even this is not invariant. The notion of topology, the way we usually think about it, is not an invariant concept. And different frames view the same space with different topologies, even though they are identical physics. So for example, you can have two spaces which look very different topologically, different number of holes and handles. Nevertheless, they can have yield identical physics denoting here by W and M, these spaces. OK, so we learned the distance is not an invariant concept. The handles and the holes are not an invariant concept. How about the dimension of the space? That's the, the grossest, one of the grossest things you can say in terms of the grossest characterization of the space you can say in terms of it, namely dimension. Is it one dimension, two dimension, three dimension? Is that an invariant concept? Is the dimension of space? 3 plus 1. Well, actually, there are two questions. One is whether the dimension is an invariant concept, and the other one is whether the actual space on time dimension is 3 plus 1. First of all, in the context of string theory, we, we, have, an, we have learned that you cannot have it space on time to just be three space on one time. You need extra dimensions. But these extra dimensions are, should be viewed as tiny. Otherwise, where are they? We only see three spatial directions. Where are the other spatial directions? So we have some other extra dimensions, which are kind of wrapped like a circle. If you think about this hose as our, as our space, one, one dimension, or in this case, three dimensions of it are long. But the other directions, like this one circle that I'm drawing here, are tiny. So from far away, it looks just like this line. So, so our three-dimensional space can fool us to think we are in three-dimensional space. But there are these other internal, internal uh, directions that are tiny. So in fact, we have learned in the context of string theory that the dimension of space time is not 3 plus 1. But is, how about this dimension itself? Whatever the dimension you want to choose, let's say string theory says it's 10 dimension, 9 space and 1 time, is that number 9 and 1, it does, does everybody agree that that's the number? Or different frames give you different numbers? It turns out that even that's duality frame dependent statement. Even the dimension of the space is not an invariant concept. So that's the most basic thing. You cannot even count how many dimensions we live in. That, can, that depends on who is measuring it. Analogous to Einstein's relativity saying somebody is going with which velocity. Namely, an example of it is that you can have, for example, a 10-dimensional space. looks perfectly 10-dimensional. But if you change one of the parameters in string theory, in this case what we call the coupling constant, an extra dimension emerges and looks 11-dimensional. Now, but you could say, OK, well, you could say that this is, this is a trick because, you know, after all, it was 11 dimensional. You're just looking far away. So that's, that's a cheat. But actually, there are even more dramatic examples of this. But before I get to it, I just want to give an example of how this 10 going to 11 does to string. So if you have a string which starts going from one side of the space to the other, as you increase that parameter g I was drawing in the previous uh, slide, the dimension goes up by 1. And the string itself goes up in one dimension, becomes a membrane. So even the objects change dimensionality when this happens. So it looks like a, a string becomes a sheet. And the space grows. But there, the more dramatic example of the change of dimension comes in the following example. You, you imagine the space and time to be 11 dimensional, 10, 10 space and one dimension. This is a corner of string theory known as M theory. 
And imagine taking out of those 10 dimensions of space, two of them to be a, what we call a torus, which looks like a donut-shaped object, a tiny donut, and the rest of it keep it big. But take two of them to look like a donut, a tiny donut, and take the donut-shaped object, this torus, shrink it to zero size. Basically, when you shrink it to zero size, it's like getting rid of it. So your space sh should look like nine-dimensional space when you look at it tiny, tiny, tiny. So the 11 dimensional theory should become nine-dimensional, right? That's, that would be no trick here. You just change the shape. If you put the magnifier, it's still 11 dimensional. Well, it turns out when you do this, the theory becomes 10 dimensional, not nine dimensional. Bizarre. That's the kind of statement I mean. The notion of dimension is not an invariant concept in string theory. Distance is not invariant. Topology is not invariant. The dimension is not invariant. We have to radically change the way we think about space and time. So even though these aspects of string theory are quite amazing, but the main aspect of string theory is understanding quantum geometry. Quantum geometry refers to trying to unify geometry with quantum mechanics. This was, after all, one of the triumphs of string theory. You try to combine these two pillars of physics, quantum theory and Einstein's theory of gravity, or which is geometrically based theory. So what do we learn about the quantum geometric aspects of string theory? So the very first thing is that we want to understand is the notion of fundamental. Is the notion of fundamentalness invariant? Namely, when we talk about fundamental constituents like fundamental particles, whether that notion is something that everybody agrees. You say, there's an electron. This is a fundamental particle. There's a photon. That's a fundamental particle. Is that notion a duality frame invariant concept? So in fact, in particle physics, we divide the particles into two types, elementary and composite. By looking at this picture, you can imagine that I'm thinking of this like, for example, the nucleus of an atom made of different constituents. Each one of those constituents perhaps could be elementary, if maybe they are made of something else too. But you wouldn't think that there is, at some point, you will have a basic object and elementary object. So the question is, does the notion of fundamental particle, fundamental entity, something that everybody agrees on? Or there could be some disagreement on what's fundamental or not. It turns out that the notion of what is fundamental even depends on the frame of reference, the duality frame. Some people might think this is fundamental, and the other one is composite. And some other person will think opposite. So in fact, a nice example of this is in the context of uh, monopoles versus electrically charged matter. So magnetic monopoles, like these, uh, these objects which are just a single uh, pole of a magnet, for example, have been uh, seen in theoretical examples of, uh, of quantum systems to exist. But they are typically very massive. And so they, are very, they, should, they should be viewed as kind of being made up of these more elementary constituents involving electrically charged fields. So you can have some composite combination of these electrically charged fields, which behave as if they have magnetic charge. And they are, these are the analog of the monopoles, the magnetically charged objects. So we, we usually view monopoles as composite, made up of these more elementary ingredients, which is why we, we kind of don't think we see them in experiments, because they are so massive and so big, they are hard to make. But if you change your parameters, they can shrink the center of these monopoles to begin to look like a point. And in fact, from their perspective, you can actually have a complete reversal of a description. As you shrink them, as you change your parameters so the magnetic monopoles become light, the, ele the electrically charged object becomes massive and heavy. And so when you want to describe the electrically charged objects, they can themselves be viewed as composites of these magnetically charged objects. Very bizarre. So the notion of what is fundamental or not gradually changes as you change the parameter. As this monopole shrinks to a point, it behaves like an elementary particle. And the electron, which was looking elementary, becomes fatter and fatter and looks like not an elementary particle anymore. You could say, well, at some point it was, and now it's not. Well, but there's no exact dividing line. Where do you divide it? 
there is no dividing line. Therefore, the notion of fundamental particle is not fundamental itself. We cannot have the notion of what is fundamental. Another example happens for strings. I, I told you that in the context of string theory, point particles are replaced by strings or higher dimensional objects. Well, what about those? Well, it turns out that in string theory also, we have a notion of a light string. Here I'm denoting it by a thin red string and a, and, a, and a very heavy string, analog of these monopoles, which are really fat, heavy guys. So by this thick yellow line. But as you change some of the parameters in the theory, the light one becomes gradually heavier, and the heavier one becomes gradually lighter, which I'm denoting here by changing the width of the string. And as you change, it, change the parameter a lot, the light one becomes really heavy, and the heavy one becomes really light. And in this corner, you can think about this other string as being composite and the other one being elementary. OK, so there is no fundamental notion of elementary string in this sense. They, they actually change. So there's no notion of fundamentalness here. In fact, this actually poses a big, big uh, challenge for understanding quantum mechanics. You see, Feynman had a very beautiful description of quantum theory in the very uh, geometric way of saying, if you want to talk about the, the probability of a particle going from a particular point at a given time, denoted here by space-time event A, going to a particular point B at a later time, what you need to do is to sum over all possible paths that can go. But to, you know, in order to formulate quantum mechanics in this way, as Feynman does, you have to say what is the notion of fundamental particles. Because this formulation of quantum theory relies on summing over only fundamental particles, not composites. Otherwise, it would be redundant you will have to choose the fundamental particles. So you say, OK, I will just choose fundamental particles. And I saw what calculate all possible ways they can go from one to the other to describe my physics. But if you don't know what is fundamental, what do you replace this picture with? We do not have that picture yet. This is on the, on the border of what we have understood in string theory. We have known that there is no notion of fundamental particle, but we don't know what replaces Feynman's formulation of quantum theory. This must be replaced by something else. So this has to go too. Feynman's path niggle has to be replaced by some other thing, and we don't know yet. Now we're getting to even more basic things. Is the notion of quantum itself. What is quantum? Is that notion duality invariant concept? Do everybody agree that this, this thing is a quantum effect? Or this thing is not a quantum effect. Is that notion duality invariant statement? So I told you, uh, quantum mechanics basically comes about by starting with the something which we call the classical system, the usual system that we usually think about. But we quantize it, which means that it basically introduces a fuzziness. So for example, when I was describing the electron inside the atom, the position of the electron became fuzzy. So there's this fuzziness, which is quantum. So you could say, aha, uh -huh. if I look at the inside the atom, that fuzziness is a quantum effect. Right? Just, it's not point-like, it was just fuzzy. So you can distinguish the fact that there is some quantum effect. So in that case, it looks like an invariant concept. What is this fuzziness is the quantum effect. So I draw this by this picture. So you can have, I'm just drawing a shape of something like, if, say, the path of the electron or something. So classically, it could have some particular shape, very specific point going in the very specific trajectory. Quantum theory says, no, no, it's not exactly one point. It's actually fuzzy. So we can say, aha, uh -huh, this fuzz around the straight line or, or very sharp line is because of quantum phenomena, which is this here I have denoted by the parameter, the famous uh, Planck's constant, which denotes how much effect of quantum mechanics you have. You can dial that to make the quantum effect bigger or smaller. So, so you can say, OK, there's a classical piece, and then there's a quantum part. OK, it looks like an invariant concept. It turns out that even that, the notion of what is a quantum effect is not an invariant concept. How could that be? It's so obvious. You know, you have this thing that gets fuzzy. How could that not be an invariant concept? Well, what happens is roughly like this. 
You start with something which you thought is classical, and it becomes fuzzy. But if you take an extreme fuzziness, it becomes, again, looking classical, but a different classical system. So the quantum mechanics is a way to go from one uh, quantum mechanics dials from one classical picture to another one as you dial this fuzziness. So which one is more fundamental, this classical or that one? You pick, you pick. So the notion of quantum effect is not fundamental. So the pillars of physics are falling one by one down. I'm telling you what is not going to stay. The notion of quantum versus classical is not fundamental. Does quantum matter exist in higher dimensions? Well, we know that in three-dimensional space and one time, there is, there is matter, you know, electron, quarks, this and that. Do they exist in higher dimensions? Of course, uh, I have to clarify the question. I have already told you string theory lives in higher dimensions. So of course, since string theory is, is made of things, it's, so there is some matter in higher dimensions. So what I mean here more precisely is whether they're interesting quantum systems, interesting, inter interesting interactions like the kind of things we see inside the nuclei, the confining quarks through these strong forces inside the nuclei. Are there interesting quantum matter systems in higher dimension? That's not obvious. And in fact, there are heuristic arguments that says that in three plus one dimensions, the only way you can have interesting matter systems made of particles. And that's, in other words, sorry, if you want to have things made of particles, you only can go up to three plus one, no higher. But in string theory, it turns out you can go higher, and it turns out you can go all the way up to six dimensions. And we have discovered theories of matter, interesting matter, similar to things that could be very exciting, like, like the, the nuclei and so on we are familiar with, if you go all the way up to six dimensions. So up to six dimensions, we can have interesting matter. What kind of matter can you get from them? What kind of nuclei or things can there be? What kind of periodic tables would that give rise to? Very interesting. So these are the new things we have learned, but we have also learned these are the basic entities for these theories will be these, uh, instead of particles, they are made of tensionless strings, the strings which are very light. So these are new theories that physicists are uh, intensely working on to try to unravel the analog of these new kinds of matter systems in these higher dimensions. Very enigmatic theories, and we are we are in the early days of understanding these theories. We have very little computational tools, and we are building up computational tools to try to address, uh, address some of the questions we would like to answer. The next question, again, a fundamental question. Do black holes have microstates? Now, you have heard about this in previous talks, that black holes are black, and they apparently behave, uh, according to Bekenstein and Hawking, as if there is some degrees of freedom in it associated to the boundary of it, to the horizon of it. And this is surprising that there is such a degree of freedom because if you solve Einstein's equation with a given mass and charge and this and that, the solution has only, you find only one solution, exactly one solution with those properties. And this means there is no disorder, there's, there's complete order. The entropy, the number of degrees of freedom is just one. There's only one possibility, our entropy is zero. But through some arguments, Bekenstein and Hawking show that the number of degrees of freedom for a black hole should be huge and basically exponential of the area of this horizon surrounding the black hole in the fundamental unit, units, uh, Planck units, divided by four. So this is a huge number of states. But the problem was, for Bekenstein and Hawking, they could not account for where they come from, where are these degrees of freedom, because Einstein's equation doesn't show it. You solve the Einstein's equation in three plus one dimension, there's a unique solution. There's, where, where are these other solutions correspond to? And this also suggests an amazing new principle, what's, what's called holography, that the number of degrees of freedom, usually in physics, goes like, the log of the number of degrees of freedom goes like volume, that is, if you look at the degrees of freedom, they are situated in different points of space, and so the bigger the volume you have, proportionally the bigger entropy you get. Here we're having a situation which instead of volume goes like area. That's bizarre. And this is sometimes called holography that they, somehow the degrees of freedom behave as if they're in one lower dimension, like hologram. 
instead of in three dimensions, like, like in two dimensions. There's, there's, something, there's some, uh, something strange about this relation, and it's called holography. So the question would be, what are these states? Where are they hidden? And string theory answers these questions in an elegant way. So here I'm denoting, uh, as I mentioned to you, the space of the space has, let's say, three macroscopic dimensions, the ones that we see. And then there are some hidden dimensions or tiny dimensions, which I'm drawing here by this red uh, donut-shaped object torus. So you can think about this as the internal degrees of freedom uh, of, the, of the geometry of string. And then you can, take, you can take one of these strings or membranes and wrap it around these cycles of this, uh, of this uh, donut at a given point in space. So you take this point in space, and over that point, you take this guy and wrap it around uh, the space in this way. This will give you a tiny mass if you just wrap it once. But what can you do if you want to make it more like a black hole? A black hole is a very massive object concentrated in a small region. What you can do is you take the string and wrap it more and more, or this membrane and wrap it more and more around the cycles. And what you find is that if you do that, the geometry changes. And you create, in this way, a black hole. And as you can see, the degrees of freedom here, they're no, it's not manifest here, what are the degrees of freedom, but they're up here. So you count how many ways are there, and of course, there's going to be something related to the size of this hole, because they're creating that hole. So you count whether the number of states that you did by counting how many ways this string or membrane can wrap around these cycles, count all these possibilities, and lo and behold, you find that it's given by exponential of the area over 4 of this black hole. So this is a confirmation that the idea that Bekenstein and Hawking had is correct. But it also says that this, the states that they were looking for, the microstates of the black hole, were hidden in the internal dimensions of string theory, the ones that are tiny that you couldn't see. In these examples, that's how they arise. So this is accounting for the microstates of a black hole. As, as membranes, or what we call generally brains, in the internal dimensions of string theory. Is electromagnetic forces distinguishable from gravitational forces, or can they arise from one another? In other words, how fundamental are electromagnetic forces and gravity forces? Are they distinguishable? You know, you would think that gravity and electromagnetic forces are completely different things. It turns out that even that's not fundamental. Whether you call a force gravitational or non-gravitational turns out also to be not a duality frame invariant concept. That gravity can be mimicked by, by, by extra forces, by, ex by electromagnetic type forces. So in fact, let me explain. Um, let me just go back here a second. So, so there, there are two sides to this question. One is, whether the electromagnetic forces can mimic gravity, or whether gravity can mimic electromagnetic forces. And both can happen, as it turns out. So for example, if you have a cone-like object, gravity can create these cone-like deficits. And of course, it's behave as if there is a particle. There there is. And so it affects the degrees of freedom passing through it. And it turns out that at these points, these conical points, they themselves will have some kind of forces living there. So having these kind of conical shaped object in the context of gravity leads to forces living on these singularities of this like tip of this cone. Or more generally, if there's a geometry where the tip of the cone is along a line, along those lines or along these shapes, you'll get new degrees of freedom which play the role of forces, fundamental forces, it turns out. So like the kind of forces we in, involved in uh, between quarks, the gluons, and so on. So those forces can be mimicked by pure geometry. So geometry can mimic forces. And uh, the reverse is also true. That is, gravity can be mimicked by electromagnetic forces as well. More precisely, there are generalization of electromagnetic forces, where instead of one photon, you have a huge number of photons interacting with each other in a complicated way. And if you take a large enough number of these photons interacting with each other, let's say in 3 plus 1 dimension, it actually behave as if a 4 plus 1 dimensional gravity theory. So you can kind of holographically develop one extra direction, 
that's part of the statement that the dimension is not an invariant concept that shows there. But moreover, gravity is not distinguishable from fundamental from element from gauge forces or electromagnetic type forces. So, so even that is not a duality invariant concept. So this is here I'm drawing a thinking about the space as a four-dimensional sphere, if you can imagine a four-dimensional sphere as being the boundary of a five-dimensional gravitational theory. So, so you can describe what's going on inside here by properties of electromagnetic type forces on this boundary, and this is called holography. It's quite a remarkable phenomenon. So you can have exchanges of gravitons, et cetera, being described by properties of the theory on the boundary. And this can be uh, visualized geometrically by saying that there is some phase transition in the context of string theory. You can have membranes stretched between two sides of the universe. And if you take a large number of them, so these membranes give you the analog of the n by n matrices the way I was telling you. And so give you n squared type degrees of freedom on these matrices. If they take n to be very large, it turns out to change the geometry of space itself. And the space undergoes a transition where they disappear and they replace these brains by fluxes. And this actually is the, is, is the geometrical underpinning of this holography that I was just describing. The next question is, is the universe unique? Now, this is surprising. The universe, of course, is unique. That's the word universe. I mean, it sounds like it's an obvious answer to that question. And it, in fact, that is not even true. The universe, or the potential universes, or logically consistent universes, are not unique in string theory. And we have a huge number of allowed consistent solutions in string theory. So there's no uniqueness. There's a huge landscape of possible universes which are consistent in string theory. And this is sometimes called multiverse. And each one has their own properties. And we seem to be living in one of these very exceptional corners of this landscape with very exceptional forces, with very special properties of dark energy and this and that. But nevertheless, the potential vast possibilities of all possible string landscape is enormous. So that's also strange. The uni uniqueness of the universe is also not true. So let me conclude by telling you that string theory has been leading to a revolutionary revision of many fundamental and long-held principles of physics. There are many hints for a new principle new principle of physics to take hold, and where duality frames play the same role as Einstein's uh, reference frames. But we have not come up with that overarching principle that combines all these into one fundamental law of nature. And so it's clear, nevertheless, that by the time the dust settles, physics will look very different. Thank you.